Good afternoon. Welcome to this month's Interior Museum Lunchtime Lecture Series. My name is Diana Warren. I'm the Director of the Department of the Interior Museum here in the Interior Building, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Uh, this is part of an ongoing monthly lecture series that we host typically on the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, highlighting the various bureaus of our department and their, um, their projects, both domestically and internationally. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Bathrick today. Uh, he's been the director of the Office of Aviation Services, or, or OAS, uh, since 2005. Uh, prior to joining DOI, Mr. Bathrick completed a distinguished career with the United States Navy, retiring as a captain. A decorated naval aviator and test pilot, uh, Mr. Bathrick logged over 3,700 flight hours and more than 800 arrested landings aboard 10 different aircraft carriers during over, numerous overseas deployments. A graduate of the prestigious uh, Navy Fighter, Fighter Weapons School, or Top Gun, and the British Empire Test Pilot School, ETPS. He's flown 40 different types of military and civilian fixed wing, rotary wing, and lighter than air aircraft, having qualified as a pilot in command in 12 different models. Since joining the Department of the Interior, Mr. Bathrick has led OAS to numerous national level and industry recognitions, including the Federal Aviation Program Gold Standard Certification 2007 to 2016 and 2008 the Federal Aviation Program of the Year in the small category, and ISO 9001-2008 quality certification. In January 2010, Mr. Bathrick was personally recognized by the Department of the Interior Honor Award for Merit a Meritorious Service uh, for his development in innovation aviation policy solutions to critical bureau missions. Mr. Bathrick holds a Bachelor of Science a degree in aerospace engineering from the United States Naval Academy and an exec executive master of business administration from Boise State University. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Beck. Thank you, Diana, and thank you everyone for uh, uh, coming here today. This is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, as you can see there, uh, I'm from uh, Boise, Idaho, although I did uh, do three and a half years here uh, in the five-sided daycare center across the river um, when I was in the Navy. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here to talk to you today about the Drones for Good program, and uh, I appreciate the kind words uh, about uh, myself and about our organization, Office of Aviation Services, but this is really a, a team story about the department and its bureaus, which you can see represented there up on the screen. You know, a lot of people think that drones are a new thing, but actually uh, drones uh, first began the same year that this uh, department was born, 1849. Um, so they've been around for a while. I can say I've got some experience in drones, thankfully not that amount of experience. Um, along my time as a, a Navy pilot, I also got the opportunity to kind of be a drone. Uh, the fighter squadrons I was a part of all had the tactical reconnaissance mission. And I thought that was cool, we got to go low and fast, but then I found that people didn't like uh, their pictures being taken and they expressed their displeasure by uh, shooting bullets and missiles at you. So uh, I am really grateful that we have unmanned aircraft to do some of these uh, the missions. And later on in my career, I got to, to understand some of the intricacies of cultural and natural resources and wildland fire when I had command of a very large base that uh, had to deal with all of those. Office of Aviation Services, uh, we're part of the Office of the Secretary and uh, we have uh, a, a few primary roles. First and foremost, we provide the department with the ability to comply with the, the laws and regulations regarding uh, uh, manned and unmanned aircraft as a federal uh, user of manned and unmanned aircraft. We also ensure that our bureaus, our nine bureaus, are able to deploy annually with safe and mission ready personnel and uh, aircraft. And that happens every year, whether it's uh, you know uh, a hard fire year or not. And then we're also responsible, and so we get into the drone work, uh, conduct DOI aircraft uh, and equipment research and development efforts. Part of our commitment is to stay small. We're only five percent of the total aviation budget, 
and uh, and to provide quality work. Um, you heard mention about our uh, ISO 9001 now 2015 uh, standard certification. We celebrate that uh, our 10th year uh, in that uh, in our 45th year as an organization. And you see in that slide there about you know what our motto is 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 what have you done for the field today? And we serve. Uh, the secretary, but we really serve the bureaus and we're there to ensure that they're able to do their job. And a little bit about your program. So, you know, in, in business, you know, what gets measured gets attention, what gets measured is important, but also being able to measure relevant things. And the UAS program, the drone program within Interior uh, has many relevant measurable things. Uh, people would like to talk about that we're second uh, only to DOD in scope and uh, reputation, over 12,000 flights, lots of unique FAA granted authorities. Um, and I'd like to talk to some of the savings. We'll see a, a slide later on in a video about $50 million saved on uh, one particular operation. And across those 12,000 flights, we've saved uh, about one seventh the time and uh, being able to conduct those missions in one seventh the time and about one-tenth the cost as a rule of thumb. But some of the ones I'm most excited about, particularly given our landscape that we fly over, which is all public land, is the fact that we had 12,000 flights and zero public complaints, and we'll talk about that. Along the way, we've actually become a model for others to follow. We're starting to pay it forward to those organizations. We're currently working with 21 different federal, state, and municipal governments to help them build similar uh, unmanned programs. So let's talk about the why, the how, and the what. So why drones for the Department of Interior? I'm often asked that, and, and I kind of flippantly say, we have 500 million reasons to use drones. Uh, that's the amount of land space, and not the offshore 1.7 billion acres in the outer continental shelf, but just onshore in the United States that we're responsible for. We're the largest single land steward in the United States like one in every five acres. And we, although we have 70,000 wonderful, hardworking employees, that's not enough employees to do everything that we need to do. And so we're able to perhaps close some of those outcome gaps that we've had. And I believe, and we'll show some opportunities to actually leapfrog uh, into the future and uh, accelerate that change of pace. The other thing we have to remember is where we operate, particularly in the West, uh, very diverse, uh, inhospitable environments, uh, and it's all public land. So I would like to do all of this work in supporting this management of the land without disturbing your trip to Yellowstone or your hiking or camping or however you're using that. And then lastly, we have to remember that our land that we are stewards of contains some of our most precious uh, monuments and certainly uh, quite a bit of our national infrastructure. And so to monitor that and and uh, manage it well, uh, we're using drones. So how? So how do we do this? Um, this innovation uh, map I've used in, in the past successfully. So first we want to develop a compelling vision. Um, drones for good kind of sets that apart. Then we wanted to have a comprehensive strategy, we'll talk about that. Um, we had to go and really put some meticulous planning to this to ensure uh, we could succeed in our execution, and then we have to be disciplined in our execution. Finally, we have to measure what we do, and we have to make sure those measurements are relevant, and then we incorporate that and we do it all over again. And so that's basically how we um, institute our program. So what do we get out of it? If you're familiar with the, the drone world, you've heard dull, dirty, dangerous, denied access is the reasons to have drones. Um, those are really the conditions where drones are uh, applicable and, and fit well, but what do you get out of that? And, and for us, we develop what we call the, the six S's. So first, we're a science-based organization. We make decisions on how to manage the land, what you can do with it based on science, and that science comes from sensing. And now we're able to, with these drones, put some tremendous sensors and tremendous processing capability into the air. Safety. We do a lot of dangerous work, not only in the air, but on the ground. And we have the opportunity with these drones to reduce the risk to our employees and to the public through that. And we'll show some examples. The savings. Our current inventory of fleet drones are about 400. Um, the acquisition, the training, the maintenance, all of that is so much less than 
the manned aircraft world. To put it in perspective, uh, we have about 90 manned aircraft in our fleet, and the entire drone fleet uh, in our uh, government-owned fleet is less than some of the single aircraft that I have in the manned fleet. It cost just one of those costs more than 400 that I have in the, in the unmanned fleet. Service. Uh, you can imagine what it takes to schedule, launch a helicopter to go out and fight a wildfire, go out and survey uh, animal species, uh, whatever you might do. Uh, imagine that compared to literally opening your backpack and pulling out your drone and launching that. So we're a lot more responsive. And if you think about what Interior is responsible for, a lot of it, um, a lot of it happens with us having 49% of the vote. Uh, you know, the volcano didn't erupt, the hurricane didn't come in, the fire didn't start when we wanted it to, it started when it wanted it to. Same with animal migrations. So that service is incredibly important to us. The last two at the bottom you see in, in kind of the brown, those are kind of really future looking. And we know, you know, as a society, uh, it's a struggle to get kids interested in science, technology, engineering, math, and art. And we know that fewer kids are getting out into the wild uh, into the places that you know I spent a lot of time as a kid. So for the sustainment of our organization, the Department of the Interior, getting young people interested in science, technology, engineering, art, math, as well as interested in what we do in the Department of Interior, I think can happen through the use of drones. And uh, we work a lot with uh, groups, uh, nonprofit groups that are uh, having these kind of workshops for teachers and also with uh, young, young people. So, you know, at least we picked something to institute that didn't have a whole lot of challenges or controversy. Uh, you know, uh, for many, many years, and for some people still today, drones are thought of as weapons or spy tools. Uh, you know, we've all probably had our personal information compromised by some company or federal agency, uh, and so there's all of these, these challenges. What we did is, is not just meet those challenges, but we use those challenges as the foundation for our program. As an example, uh, on the front page, on the last page, uh, you'll see our website. If you didn't get that, uh, just Google DOI UAS and you'll find us at the top. If you went on our website, you would find probably a week's worth of reading and videos for you to review. And that's intentional because transparency and, and showing that you know we are here as drones for good to help manage your lands uh, is incredibly important to us. We also want to meet your expectations, uh, good investment, uh, great return, and we want to do it with few resources. We actually built our program in OAS with no additional money and no additional personnel. We used our quality management uh, efficiencies we gained through uh, ISO certification to actually free up six positions and uh, so we have a division of six people in OAS that actually manage this entire program for us. You know, I call uh, success a team sport. Uh, first thing we did was reach out to those folks like the Department of Defense who had been doing this for years. I had been there and, and knew what was available. And then we reached out to our partners like the FAA, academia, industry, lots of industry groups like AUVSI. Uh, and, and tried to copy as much as we could from them while I reinvent what's already been invented and proven. And uh, I'm very happy to say now uh, the flow is, is going not only both ways but out to others who we are uh, bringing in as new partners. Uh, some of those 21 agencies I mentioned that uh, we're actually helping build their programs. I'm actually in DC this week to uh, have some of those meetings to continue helping those those agencies build good, responsible DO, uh, UAS programs. So a little bit more about the how. You know, I love try before you buy. And, and having come from DOD, I knew that uh, small unmanned aircraft in the Department of Defense um, were, for some of us, probably like uh, cell phones with teenagers. The new one comes out, and they already want that one, even though the old one is still pretty capable. So we were able to get from our, our partners at DOD $25 million worth of um, sometimes brand new uh, equipment, uh, small UAS, for free. And we got enough of them so we didn't have to maintain them. And we used those from 2009 to 2015. And what did we do with them? We did operational test and evaluation. We looked at our missions and we saw where they would fit and we learned a few things. 
helped us with our requirements, but we learned that operating drones that were intended to fly overseas with overseas frequencies were not so easy to fly in the United States to get a spectrum authorization. We also learned that some of the things that we had as requirements were lesser requirements for DRD. Our resolution requirements are such that I need to be able to tell if that bird, which looks just like the bird next to it, has a red beak or a black beak. An actual survey we did in Alaska because that's the only way I can tell. And so our resolution requirements were much greater. That was a great experience though because it helped us develop requirements that then went into our first uh, acquisitions of fleet aircraft. You can see on, on the right there, we now have, uh, I think, the world supply, remaining supply of 3DR solos, uh, and about 400 of those. And we just uh, this year uh, also bought the Firefly Pro uh, VTOL fixed wing, and we have one pulse vapor. We carry a, a very expensive LiDAR on occasionally. So that's our current fleet. One of the things that was key to our program was versatility. And I think uh, it was a recognition that although I am an aero engineer and a pilot, the, the vehicle is just the truck. It's only there to get that sensor and the associated equipment into the air. And so we actually qualified 16 different sensors to go on that, that solo quadcopter. And you're talking a $2,000 quadcopter, and we have all of these various sensors that we can put on there. And, and that's really a theme of our, our program. This year, we just awarded our first commercial contract for UAS services. Why did we do that now and not before? You know, it was all part of our program to kind of crawl, walk, and walk a little faster. So we're very excited to have this. We actually uh, had the first use of the contract this weekend. The uh, Bridger Aerospace Silent Falcon was flying on the Martin Fire in northern Nevada, a 435,000-acre fire that spanned 60 miles east to west. And uh, the Silent Falcon was put up on a number of flights, flew almost uh, six hours of total time, providing incident commanders with, with uh, valuable information. So across all of our work with the DOD drones and now with our current drones, we've uh, qualified these drones in, in over 25 different missions. I was asked, you know, what, what, what don't you guys do? And I said, well, I don't know of a commercial application that's either being done now or thought of that we aren't doing now or we aren't going to do in the future. I think we've delivered stuff before Amazon did. So, you know, um, Really, this, no pun intended, the sky's the limit. And across all of these, these applications, we're seeing a rule of thumb. We're able to complete these in about one-seventh the time and about one-tenth the cost. And you know what a rule of thumb is like. It's like your rule of thumb to get to work. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's, you know, you get all the green lights. But this has been consistent throughout this, and that's a tremendous increase in efficiency um, as well as safety because we're taking people off the ground in some very dangerous situations and substituting something that isn't going to get hurt. Part of our transparency, we put together a report 2017, put it out on the, on the web. Um, it was a, really the, what I call the hockey stick year for our program. Uh, we, at that time, had flown about 9,000 total missions. We flew 5,000 in 2017. Uh, across 32 different states, 25 different applications, six of our nine bureaus flying those, and now we're up to 12,000 uh, flights, and then, of course that number's old because we're, we're flying today uh, quite a bit. Let's talk about some of the, the specific missions. Uh, so last year we were on every single hurricane from Harvey to uh, Irma and Maria, um, and really did some, some great work. The bureaus were down there, uh, doing damage assessments, taking a look at areas that people couldn't get into to see if they were inundated, doing 3D models to determine what the extent of the damage was, and then helping uh, folks decide you know, what it was going to take to reconstruct some of these things, doing work cost estimates. But I think probably the, the most satisfying thing for many of us in this business was the ability to give folks that live and work down there some idea of what was going on. What was what was their neighborhood like, and, and when could they possibly get in there? What was the extent of the damage? And this uh, Virgin Islands National Park hurricane report, you can find out on our website as well. Great, great report by National Park Service. Search and rescue is another area that we looked at, and, and we've been operating in 46 flights, seven incidents last year. 
you know, it's much more responsive than having to go get a helicopter. It also takes our, our park rangers out of, uh, out of harm's way. You know, if someone's trapped on a, uh, on a cliff ledge, uh, it's much easier and safer to send a drone down there and, and see if this is still a rescue or a recovery uh, than it is to send a ranger over the side with a rope or get a helicopter out, and we can usually get that drone out there much faster. In the future, we're, we're looking at improved sensors, and I'll talk about a test that we've uh, done in Boise to uh, provide emergency equipment. Um, but you see this is a really um, fantastic way of uh, using drones for, for the greater good. Speaking of that, this is a particular one from this year. Uh, many of you may have seen this. This was down in Hawaii during uh, the continuing volcano emergency. We have had a team down there since May, and they were on a mission to uh, monitor the lava flows. What happens is the lava will come out and it'll solidify and it starts to get these lava pools or lakes, and then they'll break free. And one of them had broken free and they told Emergency Operations Center, you need to evacuate this area quickly because this was very fast moving lava. And emergency uh, responders got out there, they got almost everyone out, but there was one individual was trapped uh, at their house, they were in the, trying to get uh, away, they weren't sure which way to go, they were in the jungle. And so uh, our folks were on the phone with the Emergency Operations Center, they had the Emergency Operations Center tell the guy to turn his cell phone flashlight on, they were able to locate him and they said follow the drone to safety. The individual followed the drone out of the jungle. At the same time, our folks were helping to vector the emergency responders around the roads that had been closed by the new lava so that they could find their way to, to get to this individual. Uh, happy ending, the, the uh, emergency responders were able to get to the individual, get them out of, the, out of that uh, situation and save their life. Again, I mentioned we're going to we're testing, and we have a lot of vision for future use of drones. This is a particular um, test we did, and what's kind of neat about it: we took an AED, took one of our drones, and we took some of our smoke jumper experience, and we took a, a paracargo parachute we normally use to drop sat phones to smoke jumpers after they're out of the uh, aircraft, and we rigged that up. And first, we did a uh, a bench test. We put it on a table and we dropped the AED, make sure it would leave the, the drone. Then we took it over to the Boise uh, airport to the fire center where we put it up in the loft where they string the parachutes up and we dropped it and it actually opened. And then we went out in back of our facility uh, in Boise, which I call the, the uh, OAS uh, test and training range, and we actually dropped it. And we actually had a chase drone to watch it as well. And you can see a uh, successful drop and actually on target drop delivering uh, an AED. So the potential to deliver emergency equipment uh, using this capability is, is there. We're going to continue to pursue it. I want to talk about a, a mission that is uh, clearly relevant at this, uh, this stage of our, our work and um, very, very near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, and that is uh, wildfire. You know, it just... Um, it's part of the ecosystem. We all know that it's a natural part of our world, but increasingly, it's taking lives and uh, and really destroying tons and tons of property at, at tremendous cost. In 2017, we had uh, 71,000 wildfire starts, and we lost 9.8 million acres to fire. And it cost us over three billion dollars just for the suppression. And unfortunately, for aviation, we've only been able to fight for eight hours a day for as long as we've had aviation. We don't fight at night, we don't fight in reduced visibility, and that's when 20% of our fires are starting and being discovered. So for UAS, I'll talk small UAS first. Uh, we're aggressively employing those, uh, both our fleet and I mentioned our contract. We're doing precision boundary, uh, boundary mapping and fires, hotspot detection, fire behavior, and uh, route uh, danger and uh, escape detection. We have the solos for a tactical asset. The Firefly is our uh, divisional level asset, goes a little farther, can stay in the air a little bit longer, and then the contract is our strategic asset. Last year you can see the numbers there, uh, really providing our uh, managers and our firefighters on the ground with the tremendous uh, opportunity for uh, increased awareness. 
going to show you this video. This is from uh, Fire last August, and uh, it's got some audio. This is actually the individual who is flying it uh, on that fire. Our primary mission objective was to provide situational awareness for the division supervisor during a burnout operation, which was initiated to protect critical power line infrastructure from being adversely impacted, with an additional imminent threat to property and infrastructure beyond the established control line. A secondary mission objective was to monitor an active section of the fire, seen here, which was sending airborne firebrands behind the established control line. If you look closely in the video, you can actually see them getting tossed out by the large grouping of trees being consumed by the fire. The division supervisor was concerned that the fire activity was picking up and had requested that we keep a close eye on the fire until the activity decreased. We subsequently increased the duration and timing of our individual flights in order to maximize our time in the air while also yielding to air attack. After spending several minutes in the air monitoring the fire, I communicated to my visual observer my intent to return to the takeoff location. Upon final approach to the takeoff location, I quickly identified something on my live video feed that wasn't supposed to be there. A spot fire. I couldn't believe it. My visual observer confirmed what I saw on the video feed, and I began to fly towards the location in order to more accurately determine where the fire was in relation to our physical location on the ground. Once we had an approximate location established, my visual observer contacted the division supervisor over the radio and several resources were dispatched to attempt to contain it before it got out of control. Given the weather conditions, the spot fire location in relation to available fuels, and topography of the area, it is very likely that it could have threatened additional infrastructure and property if we hadn't discovered it when we did. Ultimately, the spot fire was extinguished before it became an issue. This video has proved that when you combine drone technology, a FLIR sensor, and a crew of trained drone operators, you can positively impact the outcome of a fire incident without spending a significant amount of money on putting an aircraft in the air and putting firefighters at an increased risk. I found this video to be analogous to spending an entire day fishing with not a single bite, but on your last cast you hook into the trophy fish everyone's been trying to catch. It was an amazing experience, and I really feel like my visual observer and I made a significant impact on the outcome of the operational period that day. No way I could do better than that uh, narration, especially about the fishing. Uh, this video, as well as the report that talks about the $50 million in, in infrastructure that was saved as a result of, of getting that spot fire and extinguishing it, uh, is out on our website. And you can see the, the visual conditions there. There's no way that you're going to spot that without the infrared uh, capability in the air. So one of the challenges with the, the small unmanned aircraft, and this goes to any mission, but particularly in the fire, is and I don't mean this individual, but it's it's us, it's people, and it's our processes. You know, we're we are um, we are trained now, and we have processes for technology that that we you know had in the past, not the technology of today. And so that's one of the weak points. And so when we were developing our program, it was important to make sure our people were trained, make sure our processes were able to take this data. 24 times the amount of data that you normally get. That's what DOD found when they put drones into their inventory. And so how do you, you handle that? And that's the, that's the weakness in the small unmanned aircraft. You know, uh, I was at a presentation once that said 98% of all the drone data that's been collected has not been fully analyzed. So I want to talk about a game-changing different kind of drone. And this is the uh, optionally piloted aircraft. This is an aircraft that started its life as a regular aircraft and was configured so it could fly either with or without a pilot. One of my squadrons actually had 19 of these uh, QF4 Phantoms that we could fly with or without pilots. And we use them for targets, but we also use them for some very um, dangerous flight tests. So as I mentioned, right now we only fly during about eight hours of the day. We don't fly at night to suppress fire. We don't fly in much of the morning because of the smoke. Unfortunately, those are the times when the winds are down, the temperature's down, and the relative humidity is up you know, the fire's at its most vulnerable. So um, what we've been looking at is a capability that was first developed for DOD to fly supplies for the Marines over the horizon without a pilot. Uh, DOD, I think, put in about $130 million into that program and leveraged that for fighting fires. And so we've done a couple of demonstrations of that, uh, one in 2014 at the FAA test site in New York and one out in Boise. Uh, and all these flights you see, there's a safety pilot in there, but um, a guy in a tent with a, a PlayStation controller and a laptop actually flying that aircraft um, and using waypoints to, to send it to its, uh, to its designated points to dip, get the water, and then go and drop it on its target. 
the idea is we already use these aircraft. We actually, this is the K-Max. We actually uh, currently uh, contract for those. So they would fly with man, man pilots during the day, and then at night uh, they would be quickly reconfigured, refueled, and they'd fly all night long dropping water. And then in the morning, continue that same uh, configuration. And then when we, when the, the smoke finally lifts and we get all the manned aircraft in the air, we put the pilot back in. And then when the fire's over, we just leave the pilot back in and we can go from one fire to the other. We don't have to jump through a lot of hoops to fly an unmanned aircraft through the national airspace, which is still being integrated now. So this is a capability we think is a real game changer. And why we do is because it takes a lot of that, that human out. I mean, if you're dropping water or retardant on a fire all night long, you don't have to, you know, you're not taking the place, you're taking the place of what's not there. We haven't been doing that. So you don't have to adjust your processes because you haven't been able to do this in the past. And so um, we're hopeful that this is a, a, a capability that will be uh, you know, a real game changer. And if you think about it, $3 billion and 9.8 million acres, every time you have a 10% improvement on the time and, and the area to con, you know, contain a fire, you know, that's, uh, that's a lot of money and a lot of acres, 980,000 acres and uh, $300 million. I could gold plate all these helicopters for that amount. So I want to end with talking about one of the challenges we're still working to meet, and that is, that is data. Um, you can see the, the resolution of Landsat, which is, was in, probably still is a stalwart remote sensor for Department of the Interior. Then we go down to the manned aircraft, down to a meter. And if you start going to a U.S., we start getting into hundreds, if not thousand times of uh, resolution. And resolution, like you know in some of your photos, uh, is roughly equivalent to file size. So that file size gets to be pretty high at that point. And, and so how are we going to address that? And when you look at what's predicted for the future of data uh, in the world, um, it's not just our problem, it's, it's everyone's problem. And so we are working to partner with federal agencies, academia, and our industry partners to figure out how to do this. Because uh, if we have that data but we're not able to use it, we might as well not have it at all. So uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to thank, thank you for this opportunity and just in review that, you know, um, if you're part of the department, you should be very proud. Uh, your UAS program is, is proven and, and highly respected, and that's the way we're attempting to keep it on the front edge. Um, it's very collaborative, and we're very excited to now be able to give back to those agencies that helped us as well as agencies that are looking to do the same thing that, that we did. And we're also very proud of um, the value that we're able to bring in terms of hard measurement and the transparency that has become a hallmark of our program. Uh, that's very important to us. Um, and uh, we're looking to be avid and active partners of this uh, uh, challenge of uh, overcoming the data to make sure that we can turn that data into action, which is really the end product. So as I mentioned again, if you remember nothing else from this, go to our website because there is a ton of information that I don't have 10% of the time to talk about today. But thank you very much.